Today, we're going to talk about consistency and availability trade-offs. And the background of this is a theorem that was introduced informally first by Eric Brewer, who is a colleague of mine at Berkeley and also a big wig at Google, um, way back in the year 2000 when he gave a keynote talk at the Principles of Distributed Computing Conference. And um, his, uh, his talk had actually quite a bit of influence on the database community because um, before this was made very explicit. I mean, it was something that was kind of understood among database people that you couldn't have everything. But nevertheless, there was sort of this background goal of having everything. And he stated very clearly something that is actually pretty obvious, which is that when you get network partitioning, meaning you lose connectivity on the network, then you have to give up one of consistency or availability or both. Okay, and I'm going to explain to you what these terms mean very precisely. And then what we're going to do is we're going to look at the implications that this has for cyber physical systems, which is not something that was anticipated, I don't think, at all by uh, this work in the database community. It did, you know, once this had come to the foreground and made explicit and then subsequently proved in a formal way by other people besides Eric Brewer, um, it kind of opened up the research opportunities in database systems and there was a whole bunch of innovation then that was you know explicitly giving up one of the things that previously they had tried very hard not to give up okay um okay so what do we mean by consistency and availability well if you have two software components uh communicating over a network then consistency is simply agreement on the values of shared variables so in the database context, um, if you have a distributed database, in order for the database to remain responsive, meaning to preserve availability when the network breaks, you have to replicate data, okay? And that's very commonly done in databases where you will have copies of the data um, in multiple places. And that way, um, individual components can respond even when you lose network connectivity. Um, so just having a distributed system and having a need for availability means that you have to do replication. As soon as you do replication, you have a consistency problem because you could have a situation where these two software components disagree about the value of a bird. Now, you have to understand that agreement cannot be reduced to a naive statement based on Newtonian time, that at an instant in time, both components have the same variable assignment value, okay? Because the at the same time doesn't make any sense, okay? So we have to reduce this to some kind of a semantic property, and we have to understand exactly what we mean by consistency, and it turns out to be a pretty subtle topic. It, it proves to be a more subtle topic in the database world than in lingua franca, because lingua franca makes the problem very, very explicit and really rather straightforward, okay, because it timestamps data. And so consistency in lingua franca will reduce to simply an agreement on the value of a variable at a timestamp, which is not the same thing as at a, as a Newtonian physical time, okay. So that makes things a lot easier. I'll show you how it makes things a lot easier today, I hope. Okay, availability then is just simply the ability to respond to reads and writes that access those shared variables. So a typical application that people talk about quite a bit uh, when they're looking at this is a, a distributed banking system where you have uh, ATM machines that dispense cash, right? And you want them to remain available so that people can get cash even if you, you lose network connectivity but there's some risk associated with that because if you have two simultaneous withdrawals occurring um, in geographically distinct places then the balance on the bank account could go negative right because each component doesn't know instantaneously about the other withdrawals that are happening all right so there's kind of a 
business design trade-off here between consistency and availability. If you want to, if, if your business decision is that you want no risk of the balance going negative, that's a strong consistency requirement. That means that a, a component here cannot, uh, cannot dispense cash until it has established the bank balance in agreement with all the other components, okay? So we're gonna see exactly how you would do that. You know, you can design systems that have that strong consistency property, but they will also have the property then that if the network breaks, you lose availability. But it's even worse because it's not just when the network breaks, it's also just a property of network latency. If you think about it, a broken network is just a network with very long latency, right? But all networks have latency and latency tends to vary over time. And it can vary depending on the, the conditions, right? It can, latency could get large if there's congestion on the network or if there's a denial of service attack happening, okay? All of these things could increase the latency in the network. And then you're gonna to have to either reduce consistency or reduce availability. And this theorem tells you you have to do one or the other. Okay. So in the context of cyber physical systems, it's not just agreement about shared variables, but it's also agreement about the state of the world, the physical plane. Okay. You could think of the state of the world as being a shared variable, right? You have sensors and actuators that are distributed across the system. They're interacting with the, with the physical world. Um, your view of the state of that world is something that you want consistency on sometimes, and you want availability in the sense that you want to be able to deliver uh, commands to an actuator in a timely way based on sensor data, okay? So availability is gonna translate into sensor to actuator latency, and consistency is going to translate into agreement about the state of the world for cyber physical systems. Okay, so let's look at a concrete example. Um, ADAS systems, which are advanced driving, driver, assisted, uh, driver assistance systems, include typically these days things like um, emergency braking with pedestrian detection based on vision systems. Okay, so this is a demo of a Denso ADAS system that is not running over that cardboard mannequin, we hope. Um, and breaking hard, you know, even regardless of what the driver is doing as it approaches that, that manner, okay? So how, how do you build a system like that? Well, you've got the brake itself. This is the actuator driver, okay? This is the system that actually pushes the calipers against the, the, the disc to apply the brake. You also have a brake pedal, okay, which is a sensor in you know, since it's the pushing of the brake pedal. You have a camera, and then you have a braking assistance system that's doing the, the image analysis to do the pedestrian detection. And both the braking assistant and the brake pedal are able to, to actuate the brake, okay? So the camera takes a snapshot at some time T, and um, that snapshot represents the state of the physical world at that time T. The image analysis is also producing a representation of the state of the world at that same time t. Okay, but it's going to take it some time to perform the analysis. If you're using an advanced um, uh, neural network system, uh, this could even be done in the cloud. There's at least some automotive vendors who have been experimenting with using. 5G communication to get relatively low latency and doing a lot of the image analysis in the cloud. But that means that this really could take quite a bit of time, right? So um, you also have this brake pedal sensor, which also represents the state of the world at a time when the driver pushes the brake pedal. Now let's suppose that the camera has taken a frame at time T and the brake pedal gets pushed just slightly later, okay? A millisecond later. 
then what should the actuator do? And if you insist on consistency, right, then the actuator shouldn't do anything until it's got these, both of these data items. And it should, in fact, process the braking assistant data before it processes the brake pedal data, right? Because the brake, braking assistant data represents the state of the world at an earlier time, slightly earlier. Is that the right thing to do? With this application, is that the right thing to do? You think if the driver pushes the brake pedal, you should wait for a response from Google's servers yeah. on the image analysis before you apply the brake? I don't think so. I don't think that would really be a very good idea at all, right? So you're gonna sacrifice consistency and you're gonna emphasize availability, right? You want to be able to respond quickly to this regardless of whether you've got consistent information, right? Does that make sense? So let's look at how you build this particular application in Lingua Franca, right? You've got your camera system. Let's suppose that it takes a frame every 20 milliseconds, so it's periodic. You've got your braking assistant that is gonna give you results every 20 milliseconds, but it's gonna take some time to do its processing. You've got your brake pedal, and the brake pedal is driven by a physical action, which you all have experience with now, I hope. Okay, so you know what that means. That means that the output here is going to be sporadic, and it will be time stamped based on the local physical clock whenever the brake pedal gets pushed. Okay, the brake pedal gets pushed, the interrupt request gets raised, time stamp data gets injected into the system, and we've got time stamp data. All right? Now, in your brake subsystem, you might have two different reactions to these two things. Put them in some order. So say the reaction to the brake pedal has priority over the reaction to the braking assistant. And um, you might associate deadlines with these. So you might want a very, very tight deadline for the brake pedal, like one millisecond, and maybe a looser deadline for the braking assistant, which you're going to have to, you know, do the engineering to decide what's achievable, given the fact that the braking assistant computation takes some time and um, what's acceptable in terms of the safety that you're trying to achieve. Right? So you have to look at the dynamics of the car and see, uh, well, maybe 20 milliseconds is enough. The camera detects pedestrians far, this far in advance. The maximum speed of the car is such and such. The stopping distance is this. You do all those calculations and you decide, okay, 20 millisecond deadline's okay. All right, so this is the kind of question that I want you guys to answer in the next uh, assignment, okay? But for a different problem. Okay. So does this design emphasize availability or consistency, which has higher precedence for this particular lingua franca program? So again, consistency means that you're going to, every component is going to process things in timestamp order. Right? So that, that's how we get agreement across the entire system about the state of the world at any time scale. Yes. So you're right that you will process the break first, but only if these two timestamps are the same. You have an event here with the same timestamp as this one, then this reaction will be invoked first. But if the timestamps are different, then um, if there is no event here with the timestamp of this event, then this event will be processed regardless of. Right? So 
And so we have the, the same problem as before. You know, suppose the brake pedal, the issue is a timestamp event with a timestamp one nanosecond bigger than this timestamp. Okay. Then under lingua franca semantics, this reaction cannot be invoked until after this reaction has been invoked with the earlier timestamp. Very good question. Um, what is the role of the deadline violations here? The, the deadline violation handbooks, right? In fact, when when are deadline violations likely to occur with these particular numbers? Exactly. Right. Think about this guy producing an event timestamp one nanosecond later than this. And this takes, say, 15 milliseconds to execute, which is good enough to meet this deadline. Okay. But because of the consistency requirement, you can't process this event with one nanosecond greater timestamp until you process this event. So you're going to wait the full 15 milliseconds, get this event and process it, then try to process this and violate the deadline. Right? Think about um, testing your system for this, right? This could be kind of hard to test, right? Because you're going to have to have you know, the brake pedal pushed really pretty close to right after one of these frames in order for the deadline violation to occur. But anytime that happens, you're going to get a deadline violation. So this doesn't look like a very good design for this system. Right? These are the kinds of trade-offs that I want you guys to explore with this other application. Right? And to try to understand why this is really not a good design for this application. So, Let's look at an alternative. Here's another um, lingua franca program. And the only difference here is that I have reduced the deadline to 10 milliseconds here, and I've put a 10 millisecond after delay on the connection here. What does that do? Well, first observation is as long as this takes less than 10 milliseconds to execute, okay, this deadline can be met. Why is that? Think about the same scenario where this guy produces an event one nanosecond later than the camera. Now, the braking assistance result is going to have its timestamp augmented by 10 milliseconds, which means that you can process this before you process this. In fact, you must. Okay. So you've got a whole 10 millisecond window here where you can go ahead and process this event. As long as this thing is finished within 10 milliseconds, you're not going to have to wait any further. Right, even if the two events end up being simultaneous, you'll process this guy before this one. Okay, so Lingua Franca gives you this very nice way to explicitly put in your timing requirements in the sense that this is a specification that says that this breaking assistant is required to be bounded and not take more than 10 milliseconds to execute. And as long as that is true, you are in fact able to meet this deadline. This is one of the things that I think is, is really the, one of the key strengths of this approach that Lingua Franca has, is that it makes these design decisions very explicit. Yeah, so let's look at that. So suppose this happens 10 milliseconds and one millisecond after the camera. Okay. If this thing is completed within 10 milliseconds, then this event will be present and can be processed right away 
without any waiting for the, that computation to finish. And then you process this. Okay, and as long as this processing is quick, which is it's just an actuation, so it should be, right? And you should be able to process this one quickly and you're okay. Right? Very good question. These are the things you have to, you have to reason through, you know, all the scenarios, right? Where how things are can align in time, right? What should the de deadline violation handlers do? Let's, let's focus on this one first. What should it do? If a deadline violation occurs, um, I think that you would probably want to design your system to make these deadline violations very uncommon, okay? Which means you really want to be sure that this thing executes within 10 milliseconds, which means that doing it in the cloud is probably not that good. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so, but you're probably going to want to do execution time analysis on this on the software. Right? Make sure that it does in fact complete within 10 milliseconds. All right. What about this one? What if this the breaking assistance deadline it, uh, is violated? Is that as much of an emergency? I mean, one nice thing about this breaking assistance is that it's actually operating continuously. Every 20 milliseconds, you're getting data. Okay. Um, the vast majority of the time in normal driving situations, um, there's no emergency. And so you could get, if you get a deadline violation here, it's probably in a situation where there is not an emergency. And so maybe it's just sufficient to light up a red light on the dashboard that, you know, alerts the driver, don't count on the emergency braking system, it's malfunctioning or something like that. Okay. So there's an asymmetry here between these, these deadlines. They really have a, a rather different safety requirements, okay? There's another aspect of this deadline though, which is a little bit weird. Um, the combination of this after delay and this deadline provides a window on the response time. Um, by default in lingua franca, the braking assistant will not respond sooner than 10 milliseconds after the camera takes it snapshot, right? Because remember, logical time chases physical time. So the camera takes a snapshot at a physical time. An event gets presented with a logical time that is 10 milliseconds greater. That event will not be processed until physical time catches up to that 10 millisecond. Okay. Which means that the minimum latency between the camera and the invocation of this reaction is 10 milliseconds. And then the maximum latency is 20 milliseconds. And if you latency exceeds that, you'll, you'll invoke the deadline violation. Okay. So another discussion point. Um, is it a good idea to have a minimum delay on that sensor to actuate a path? I mean, what if your braking assistant happens to most of the time finish pretty quickly within one or two milliseconds? Shouldn't you just go ahead and process the data? The variability of the execution time is now sort of presenting a fundamental problem. Right? If, this, if this execution time is, is reasonably deterministic, then you just set this latency to be close to that deterministic execution time, and, you're, and you don't have any problem. There's no cost. There's no additional delay, really. Right, but with today's microprocessors, you, it's very hard to get deterministic execution. Um, especially if you're running on a on a uh, you know commodity multitasking operating system like Linux. Right, if you're running on something like Free RTOS, you can probably get a much more deterministic execution time and more tightly bound execution time that is breaking the system, and consequently building your parameters. Um, but notice that whatever you put here, okay, you need to prove that your system is safe if it takes 10 milliseconds to do this computation. And if it's not safe at 10 milliseconds, then you shouldn't have a 10 millisecond delay. And if it is safe, it's probably okay to have a 10 millisecond delay. 
right? But you see, you see the trade-offs here. So now the, the cost as a system designer is the execution time variability is going to cost you money because you're going to have to spend enough on the hardware here so that even with all that variability, it doesn't exceed 10 milliseconds very often. Or, well, I guess needed to not exceed 20 milliseconds, but really, in order to maintain this deadline, you probably want to really keep it at 10 milliseconds. So execution time variability costs money in these kinds of systems when you want when you need to ensure safety because you need to build in more engineering headroom. You need a faster processor um, in order to make sure that the execution times are going to be lower. If you can get more deterministic behavior out of the processor, you have less of a problem. Okay. Um, this. Um, you know, leads to a bit of an aside, but uh, there's a, another project that my group has been working on um, sort of intermittently for several years now, which is on designing uh, microprocessors that have very deterministic repeatable timing in their execution and have competitive performance with you know, today's off the shelf microprocessors. It's a challenging problem. Um, because there's a lot of tricks that are played in microprocessor design that make execution times highly variable and statistically faster, but at the expense of more var variability usually. So the issue here is that variability is going, going to cost you. And the, you're going to have to build in these margins so to account for that variability. But the nice thing about this software framework is that your assumptions are made explicit. This is an explicit assumption that this execution time is bounded. Okay. And if that execution time gets exceeded, then one or the other of these deadlines or both will be violated. Okay. Um, suppose this is a federated design where the vision system is running on a different microprocessor with a network communication. Uh, and your braking system is on a, uh, its own microprocessor. In this context, this starts to look like a database problem, like a distributed database problem, because you have replicated state information about the physical world. And but now, this 10 millisecond delay is a, an explicit statement about your tolerance for inconsistency. What you're saying here is that it's okay with you for this federate and this federate to disagree about the state of the world as long as the disagreement is bounded by 10 milliseconds. Okay, so notice what happened. We added this delay to explicitly tolerate some inconsistency, and in exchange, we got better availability. We're able to respond instantaneously to the brake pedal pushing as long as this takes less than 10 milliseconds to execute. That's where the cap theorem comes in, right? You have to, in the distributed system, if you notice that network latency here and computation time for this breaking assistant are indistinguishable, they both introduce a delay in the communication. So if either of those or the action was if the sum of the two exceeds 10 milliseconds, that's when you've got a problem in the system. Okay. So this is where the explicit trade-off between consistency and availability becomes uh, becomes useful. Now, so you have some experience with uh, the federated execution of memory front. For this application, should you use centralized or decentralized coordination? So what, what's going to happen if you use a centralized system, okay? The centralized system is going to guarantee that the lingua franca semantics are always respected. In other words, things will be processed in time step order. That means if your network breaks, okay, or if it takes a really long time for your network to transport this message, this is going to block waiting for that message. 
And that's not going to be a good idea. We need to be able to respond to the break point. Okay. So notice what's happened is that um, we've specified our, a tolerance for inconsistency. Okay. And a tolerance for unavailability. We've got a specification for both. And our assumptions are clearly stated about when those tolerances can be met. Right? Those tolerances will be met if the sum of the execution time here and the network latency is less than 10 milliseconds. And our ability to invoke this reaction and this reaction within one millisecond is. Okay. Nice explicit assumption. So now you can check the software and see if it meets those uh, requirements. But the requirements can always get violated in the field. Any requirements can be violated in the field. The network might break, right? You, you get into a car crash and the um, wire gets broken for the network. Okay? The message is never going to get there. You don't want this guy to just sit there blocked and no response to the break point, right? So the decentralized coordinator says, so in the event that your assumptions are met, it doesn't make any difference which coordinator, coordinator you use. The centralized and the decentralized will give you the same behavior as long as the assumptions are met. But when the assumptions are violated, the two choices diverge. The centralized coordinator emphasizes, avail, uh, emphasizes consistency. It preserves the consistency, keeps it within this bound. Okay. The decentralized coordinator preserves availability and sacrifices consistency. The decentralized coordinator will go ahead and respond to this event, and then later perhaps get a message with an earlier timestamp, and poof, you know things are bad. And in the decentralized coordinator, you have a uh, safe to process handler. Uh, that you can write. Okay, so very specifically, if you're using the decentralized coordination and then work on it. You get a break pedal command, you process it, then you later receive a message with an earlier timestamp. That's a safe to process violation. If you've provided a safe to process violation handler in your code, your safe to process violation handler will be invoked. What should it do? Well, the message simply says you received an event with an earlier timestamp. And so you can't, you're no longer able to meet the lingua franca semantics. Okay. But yeah, oh, so you're saying, well, it, it depends if the breaking assistant is saying everything's fine. It's a different situation than if the breaking assistant says there's a pedestrian right in front of you. But there's a reasonable chance that if the breaking system is done with a pedestrian right in front of you, you've already run over it because it, that message was delayed. Right? It's out of spec. But yes, you're right. It could depend. You should perhaps do, do two different things. Let's suppose that it's telling you everything's fine. You get a safety process violation. What should you, what should you handle it? Yeah, we're going to some kind of a fail safe state. In this case, it's indicating a malfunction in the advanced driver assistance system. So you could you know, alert the driver that the ADAS system has gone offline. Don't rely on it. Don't try accelerating up to pedestrians to test it. <laughs> okay. um, so, you know that might be that might be sufficient to satisfy your your safety requirements, um, possibly. Okay, but there's a very interesting property about this, which is that um, the system is continuously testing itself, right? Because every twenty milliseconds, you're checking your execution time and your network latency. Every twenty milliseconds, those are being tested. If your safe to process violation handler gets invoked, the test has failed. That's kind of a nice feature in a runtime system. It's continuous self testing, right? The ADAS system ideally doesn't really do real work for you very often at all. 
In fact, ideally, you drive the car for its entire lifetime and it never does an emergency stop having detected a pedestrian right in front of you. Right, so you put a system into the car that you hope never has to do its job, but you want to be sure it's always working. So how do you test it? Well, this gives you a very nice continuous testing mechanism. It's been tested all the time. Yes. Yes, it's supporting it with this design, right? Because what's going to happen is that in, if, if your network latencies exceed the specified bound, your safety process violation handler is going to be invoked. Um, actually, that's a really good question. And yes, you can, right? You can you can build regression tests that that will check to see what the system does in all of the possible permutations. And here's how you do it, right? If you want to check what happens if this execution time exceeds this specified bound, well, you write a regression test that just pads the execution and forces the safe to process violated violation to kick in. And then you test your system to make sure that it does the right thing. For the network, it is actually a more, even more interesting approach which is one that one of the guys in my group is still working on, but he's got you know resistance proofs that you can do this. But in lingua franca, when you do federated execution, you can put all the federates into Docker containers, and then you can invoke those Docker containers with a simulated network, and you can introduce perturbations in the simulated network. You can introduce congestion, you can introduce latencies, you can introduce packet drops in the simulated network. In fact, there's a word, there's a, a term that's used for that kind of testing. It's called chaos engineering. So specifically, you, you put your components into a simulated network, and then you simulate the variety of network degradations that you expect to be able to, to encounter in the, in the field. So that's called chaos engineering. And using these Docker containers gives you a really convenient way. Um, now, it, none of this is what people do today. So the question is, what, people, what, do, what do people do today? Well, you can build a lingua franca program that does what people do today. And it's going to look something like this. OK? Um, this is uh, the, the notation that comes up when we use what's called a physical connection, which is a tilde greater than rather than a dash greater than. OK? And um, you probably haven't, have, have any of you noticed, even noticed the existence of this physical connection option in Lingua Franca? Good. We, we don't like, uh, we don't like it, right? It's for reasons that will become very, very clear to me, but it is very tempting to use it, okay? What does it do? Well, what it does is really very simple. It throws away the timestamp at the source and reassigns a new timestamp at the destination based on the physical time at which the message arrives. Okay. Why not do that? Let me let me point out why you would want to do this. Why is it tempting? Well, it has the very nice feature that you are going to process the breaking assistant data as soon as you get it. It's going to be assigned a physical timestamp that is the current physical time. You're not going to wait any more physical time to process it. Just go ahead and process it. And it's not going to get in the way. You're not, you're, you're not going to be waiting ever for the data. So you, there's no dependency now on physical time. So whenever you get a physical event here, you can go ahead and advance your logical time to the time of that event and go ahead and process the breakdown. So you get quick availability or low unavailability, right? And you're able to respond whenever the breaking assistant gives you data. This is actually what people, how people design these systems today. They just whenever the breaking system, the breaking assistant gives you data, you handle it. Whenever the break panel gives you data, you handle it. So why wouldn't you do that? The failures are undetectable. 
quit. This system could have failed completely. And there's no indication that it would have failed. You're just not getting anything. You're not getting the time spent on this work. You're know, just really testing the process. Or your network latency may be quite large. And so the data you get is quite stale. The pedestrian has been run over three blocks back. And now you slam on the brakes. Um, so you can't tell the difference between stale data and fresh data. The situation gets worse when you're actually trying to merge sensor data because you could be merging inconsistent data. Okay. So it's really much better to avoid this kind of non-deterministic design, use the deterministic mechanisms and design in explicitly your fault handlers. It makes your assumptions explicit, it makes your fault handling explicit. Pretty nice combination. Now, this particular application has the property that you really want to emphasize availability. Okay, that's why we chose decentralized coordination. That's um, in order to be able to quickly respond to the break then. But that's not always what the right choice. So let me give you another example. So this is another lingua franca program that was built by uh, Sarush Patani, um, who is joining my group as a postdoc effectively What's today? Um, tomorrow, we will officially be a post option. So, um, this is a bank of four car lot simulators um, that are pretty widely used uh, simulations of vehicles that have a nice uh, vision interface. Okay. And um, there's four vehicle controllers, and there's a model of a roadside unit that is regulating access to a four way intersection. Okay, so a car that's approaching the intersection contacts the roadside unit, gives its position and velocity, uh, asks for a reservation for the intersection, ideally, so that it can just flow right through the intersection without stopping. Okay. And you've got multiple vehicles approaching all at the same time. So the question is, for this kind of application, um, consistency is agreement on the state of the intersection, and availability is the ability to enter the intersection. Which do you want to emphasize in the event of failures? Consistency. Right? You'd rather that all four cars stopped then all four cars enter the intersection at the same time, right? It's, in this particular situation, it's really better to emphasize consistency over availability because you could get collisions if the cars disagree on the state of the intersection. So, you know, whether you emphasize consistency or availability is very application dependent. Then, and you have to design your system to explicitly make these trade-offs. So, okay. So just stepping back, you need to have replicated data whenever you want any kind of availability across a distributed system. You need to assume that updates can occur in multiple places. Consistency simply requires agreement on the order of these updates. Okay, that's if you think about it. Um, that's you, you remember I started this statement that consistency is not that the two components agree at a certain Newtonian physical time what the value of the variable is, because that's impossible. Okay, don't ask for something that's impossible. So this requirement is much looser that they agree on the order in which the updates occur. That means that has very nice properties. In the database community, they call this eventual consistency, right? If you have a sequence of updates to a variable and then the updates stop, all components will agree on the final value. Okay, that's eventual consistency in the database context. And that all that requires is it to agree on the order of the updates. Um, you have to do this with imperfect measurements of time, but if you have some form of clock synchronization, then you can use physical time to timestamp the updates 
And then you can use the numerical value of those updates to define the order. Okay, and notice that's not the same thing as saying that you're using Newtonian time because those clocks are imperfect. You're using the numerical value, which is always unambiguous. Right? You can always compare two digital numbers. They're going to be either equal or one is bigger than the other. And you define your semantics to be based on the order of those numbers. And, and in order for that to be useful, you will really need some form of clock synchronization. Um, so in the context of the, of the car brake system, um, well, I think I've already said all of this, but you know, it's you know, camera data is based on the local physical time. Uh, and timestamps are derived from that, and consistency simply requires seeing the events in timestamp order. And enforcing consistency here reduces availability. Okay. So um, let's take a stretch break. This is a good time because what I'm going to do in the remaining of our uh, time is give you a very quick sketch of how we derive this theorem, which is an algebraic relationship between unavailability, inconsistency, and apparent latency in the network, where apparent latency is a measurable time. It's not some fiction about the actual time taken. It's what you actually see as the event. And this turns out to be a rather beautiful relation that is linear in a alternative algebra called the max plus algebra. Okay. So let's take a three minute stretch break and then. Uh, 